Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, the subject tonight is scoffers, scoffers, that's people who mock God and the Bible, and it comes from our passage here, scoffers. I was saying before the service, there's no good songs about scoffers. Uh, I heard my uncle preach about hell one time, and before he preached, he said, you know, I was I'm picking out the songs. He said, there's no good songs about hell in our, our hymnal. Uh, there's just some subjects we don't like singing about. So, uh, But 2 Peter chapter 3, good to see you, Nancy. And uh, let, me, let me start by reading verses 1 and 2. We've read these verses a lot, probably because they're kind of a summary of, of the book a little bit. Uh, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Uh, verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. So he's, he's reminding them, uh, God wants us to know the truth. God wants us to live by his word. And he's warning us as well, there's going to come people who will just mock the things of God. Uh, it's, it's amazing what people will choose to oppose. Uh, but uh, one of them is, is God and the Bible. And uh, part of this danger is that of false teachers. Sometimes people will mock God, not by saying, I'm mocking God, but by saying, this is what God says. And it's false and, and wrong. In... Uh, Chapter 2, we especially looked at, at false teachers. And tonight we're going to mainly look at the scoffers. Next week we'll look at some of the answers that we can, we can give to them. Although I found this, most scoffers aren't, aren't willing to listen to answers and don't even want answers. We'll talk about that a little bit. But let me read, starting in, again in verse 3, I'll read down through verse 7. That's the main part we're going to cover tonight. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. There's a lot of things there, and we'll, we'll look at it. I was thinking as I was reading there in verse 3, the last days. Uh, the last days started when Jesus went back to heaven. You know, it, we've been in the last days. He's not talking about the last four days, the last five days. He's talking about an age, a time. Uh, this is the last time uh, before Jesus comes again. And one of the things you see here uh, as we look at this is the character of the scoffers. And I think some of it is shown just by that name, you know, that, that word, scoffer. Uh, that shows their attitude. Have you ever known somebody like that? It doesn't have to necessarily be about Christianity. There's some people, they, they just scoff at everything. doesn't matter what you say. They're going to they're gonna rubbish it, you know. And uh, that's the kind of people that we're, we're talking about, people that are antagonistic toward Christ. They're hostile to the truth. And God describes their character in verse 3 as walking after their own lusts. That's their character. Uh, these are not people that are motivated by facts. They're not motivated by intellectual arguments or scholarship. They'll use those as tools. But that's not the motive. The motive is their morals. Uh, you might have heard of a man named Huxley. Uh, Thomas Huxley was uh, a famous man when evolution was being promoted uh, by uh, Darwin. They, they called him Darwin's Bulldog. You know, he really promoted evolution. Well, his grandson, Aldous Huxley, uh, wrote a, a document called Confessions of a Professed Atheist. He said this, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. Consequently, assumed it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned excuse, exclusively with a problem in pure metaphysics. He's concerned to prove that there's no valid reason why he should personally not just do what he wants to do. For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. 
The, the liberation we desired was simultaneously a liberation from a political and economic system and a liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it inf- interfered with our sexual freedom. And as someone has said, he, he was being very honest there about th- that kind of thing. Uh, they, they weren't in it for the intellectual things. They were just using intellectualism uh, as a tool to be able to do just whatever they, they wanted to do. And that's how God describes uh, the character of, of scoffers. Uh, they fit the pattern. The scoffer fits the pattern that we saw in 2 Peter 2, verse 10. You might remember that, Second uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 10, he says, Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. He's talking about people who are selfish and rebellious. Uh, that's, that's the character of a scoffer. Uh, I wanted to share uh, that pattern of moral freedoms, if you got there, just, just quickly to show you something here. See, God's standard is that the spiritual be the strongest part of our lives. We, we always talk about being body, soul, and spirit. You ever heard that, body, soul, and spirit? Well, God intends for the spiritual to be the, the first. We should say spirit, soul, and body. Uh, that's what God intends. Show us the second one now. This is where most people are. Most people are physical. Um, they have a psychological and they have a, a, a spiritual side, but their, their main focus is, uh, is physical. And if they have a wrong response to guilt, show us the third one there. This is the kind of person we're talking about here. Uh, This is a person who rejects all standards. They're their own standard. Uh, That's why they're a scoffer. Uh, The physical, the sensual, uh, that's what everything is is about. Uh, Thank you for that. I just just thought it might help you to see a a graphic to to see the, the character of the person that we're talking about here. Their characters, they're selfish, rebellious, and immoral. And they make various attacks on the truth. He lists several here. In verse uh, 4, he says, saying, this is what they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? One of the tools that scoffers use, and this is probably the most common, is ridicule. If if you're around people who promote evolution and so on, uh, they just almost can't help themselves if creation and that kind of thing comes up, it's almost like a sneer just forms on their lips. Uh, our, our son was at a thing the other day, and he had a, had a sign on him that said, Jesus saves. And he said he'd see people go by and just smirk at him, you know, and you know, look at it. Because uh, people, the, their first uh, point of attack is, is ridicule. It's often been said, when you have no argument, you attack the man. And that's exactly what this is. Uh, when, uh, when people debate these things, uh, creationists win hands down. Uh, we had a teacher at, in Bible college, he used, to, he used to love going and debating people about these kind of things. Uh, logic goes with creation and the Bible. It doesn't go with these other things. But their, one of their uh, weapons is to treat us with contempt. And they do the same to Jesus. Oh, he's just a man. And they'll make up things about him. Oh, he had a wife, or he did this, or he did that. Uh, they'll change history, and they'll attack you. Well, you, you must be an idiot to believe that. All oh, true scientists, and they, they make up things and, and treat us with, with contempt. Now, this is nothing new. Obviously, it started when this book was written, the book of Second Peter. There was already people who were uh, attacking those who were saying Jesus is coming again. Where is the promise of his coming? Uh, For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the the beginning of creation. Uh, They're mocking the the things of God. You know, Christians expected Jesus to return. Uh, People expect his kingdom to be set up. Uh, In fact, in in Acts, when Jesus was about to go back to heaven, that was the question that they asked him. I hadn't really thought about this exactly before, but... When Jesus is saying he's, he's going back to heaven, they say, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Is this it? You know, are you going you gonna to set up the kingdom now? And Jesus said, well, that's, that's not for you to know, the times or, or the seasons. Uh, so Christians have been expecting it. Uh, the Thessalonians thought they'd missed it. If you read through the book of Thessalonians, they thought, oh, no, Jesus is coming. We've, we've missed it. Uh, but uh, God, God tells them, listen, uh, Jesus coming again is a comfort to, to Christians. Uh, let me find it here, First Thessalonians 4, verse 16. 
The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Uh, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. It's, it's something still in the future. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, Jesus is coming again, but uh, it's, it's often a, a point of ridicule. Oh yeah, you're Jesus. You know, He said he's coming again, but uh, where is he? The second argument, not only ridicule, it's hard for me to know which word to use with this, but an argument by, I'll use first the word morality, but really we're talking about immorality. Now, we see this a lot in the news right now, uh, where the common morality, can I use that phrase? What people promote as the common morality. Oh, homosexuality is okay. So if you disagree with that, you're a bad guy. We are we're coming quickly to the point where preaching the Bible, preaching Romans chapter 1, will put us in jail. It'll be a hate crime. It's, it's the common morality. And that's another point of attack. I need to give you the verse here. Uh, verse, uh, verse 3 talks about walking after their own lusts. Um, they set themselves as the standard. Whatever they think uh, is right, well, that's right. It's morality by um, voting. Decree. Yeah, by decree. 51% say it's right, so uh, that's right. Um, they, and like we read from uh, Mr. Huxley there, uh, the main point is they don't want accountability to God. Uh, Romans 1.21, when, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, when people turn away from God, the thing is, when you don't believe in God, you'll believe in anything. That's what's so amazing in, in the day and age we live in. You, know, you think with all this so-called science around and so on, you know, people would be very clinical. No, people are into all kinds of weird religions, weird beliefs. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a mess out there. Uh, so they use the argument of morality. Uh, you're wrong to say, you, you know, this uh, uh, rugby player the other day, sharing a verse that says, people who don't believe in Christ are going to hell. Oh, how offensive. <laughs> yeah, I preached that verse just a few, few weeks before. You know, the, the Bible teaches that without Christ, people are going to die and go to hell. But the common morality says that's offensive. You can't say that and keep your job. And let me tell you, folks, uh, some of you will have to decide. Are you going to believe and promote what God says, or are you going to keep your job? Or are you going to keep your life? It can come to that. Uh, so the argument of the scoffers, uh, number one is ridicule. Number two is the, the common morality. Number three, he presents uh, one here that, that comes up a lot, uniformity. Uh, he said, you know, things continue as, the, as they were. All things, middle of verse four, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And, and what the scoffer does with this, this is a historical argument, is they actually, it's called revi a revisionistic view of history. <laughs> uh, they, the scoffers in our day and age talk about history like they were there. I mean, you, don't, you won't go a day without hearing somebody talk about billions of years, millions of years. And the question we ask them is, were you there? Yeah, I was, they were talking about Uluru. Oh, it's been there you know, these many millions of years. Listen, nothing's been there for more than six or seven the most 10,000 years, according to the Bible. And uh, they, they have a revisionistic view of history and say everything's just always been going along the same. We have a long, and you can hold that out as long as you want, long time. You know, time plus chance equals everything, is their argument. Um, one person said, I don't know if this works or not, he said, by that logic, I've never died, so I never will. Yeah, it's never happened to me. How could that ever happen? Um, you know, they teach that we're just organized chemicals. And you know, the problem with that is it, it takes out the person. When you take out the supernatural, you also take out the person. And that's why so many people are committing suicide today. It's a, it's a common uh, uh, way of dying now. It's a, it's a big problem. Um, and the, the thing I find, if it wasn't so sad, it, it, it would be humorous, is that 
Evolutionists, by caring, prove creation. They care that we believe about creation. They care that we believe homosexuality is wrong. They care that we should not have coal mines and we should not do this. Uh, listen, if evolution were true, they wouldn't care. If water covered Australia, who would care? We're just chemicals. I can be a chemical as well underwater as I can above water. <laughs> that would be you know, the evolutionistic uh, attitude. So they argue by uniformity. The problem is things don't continue as they were. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. There's, there's a lot of things you could look at here. Someone pointed out the first cure for disease was in 1885. Before that, there was no cure for any disease. That was rabies. They, they worked out how when somebody got rabies, they could actually cure them. Things don't continue as they were. In 1918 and 1919, just after World War I, over 100 million people died from the flu. We think we got it bad now. You know, I think 56 people have died in Australia or something. And that's terrible. But over 100 million people, far more than any of the, the, those that died in World War I. Things don't continue as they were. Uh, in my lifetime, there's been several tsunamis. How many were killed in that one in, in Indonesia? I mean, hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, it was, I mean, just boom, like that. People gone into eternity. Things don't continue as they were. And to say so, to use that argument, that things are just always continuing the same, which is a, a common argument against God and, and the Bible and so on. You know, they talk about global warming, and they talk about the Ice Age and things like that. Well, things don't continue as they were. We can see there's, there's been change. And, and the point here is the scoffers use these things as tools to free themselves up to indulge their lusts, to take away the, uh, the standards that God would, would present. The scoffer uses uh, a atheism and agnosticism, even false religion, to free up sinners to indulge in, the, in their lusts. Uh, someone has said, there's no such thing as an honest atheist. I think I agree. Um, the character of the scoffer, the arguments of the scoffer, and then God comes down in verse 5 and 6 to the ignorance of the scoffers. Verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of. And that verse is actually talking about creation, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. God made the heavens and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Um, you know, normal logic, just normal logic says nothing comes from nothing. I mean, we understand that. We understand that things don't get better, they get worse. Look at my lawn. <laughs> if we did nothing to Brisbane for 100 years, people would struggle to find it. You know, there's, there's cities that were magnificent cities in other parts of the world that someone would discover after a few hundred years because they'd been abandoned. Uh, just normal lo logic. Uh, things are not getting better. Nothing comes from no nothing. We don't have to be intimidated by evolution. It's not, uh, it's not an intellectual process. It's a moral process. Uh, the next verse is about the flood, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Creation and the flood are two main things that the scoffers attack. Um, and yet, if, if you've ever flown just about anywhere in the world, it looks like the whole earth has been washed by water, because it has. Uh, you can go to the top of Mount Everest and find evidence of marine life. Uh, one of the commentaries I was reading, the, the author said that someone had given him a shark's tooth. And they said, I found this shark's tooth in the deserts of Arizona. <laughs> now, if you've ever been to Arizona, there's not many sharks in, in Arizona. <laughs> uh, uh, the evidence is, is there. The, the third thing that they're ignorant of, not only creation and the flood, but verse 7, I think you can say Bible prophecy. The, the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Uh, Bible prophecy. God spoke and the worlds were created. God spoke and, and the world was flooded. 
God spoke, and we have a record of that. Uh, he, he said that Jesus would come again. You know, all the prophecies of Jesus, uh, all the prophecies that Jesus will, will come again. Uh, someone has figured, and I, I don't understand how, how all this works, but someone has figured that if you just take eight prophecies about the, the coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, for those to happen by chance are basically are, are impossible. Just eight of them. And there's, I think there's like 300 of them in, in the Old Testament. Uh, Bible prophecy shows us that there is a God, a God who speaks, a God who communicates. Um, you, ask an evolutionist, if you get a chance sometime, ask them, what evidence would you accept for the existence of God? And I'll almost guarantee you the answer is, and I've asked them, nothing. There is no evidence you could give that would prove to me the existence of God. Now, fortunately, God is greater. And uh, God's mercy extends even to the scoffers. In uh, chapter 3, verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. There are some scoffers get saved. I, I was trying to think today how you'd classify Paul. He wouldn't really have been a scoffer. He was, he, he was a bully. I don't know. But can you imagine trying to witness to somebody like the Apostle Paul? Uh, you know, God's grace extends uh, to these, these folks. Uh, I do have a handout uh, here that I'd like you to, to take. There are some arguments that as creationists and Bible believers we should not use. Uh, there are some things like uh, that Darwin recanted on his deathbed, or the moon dust thickness proves a young moon, or uh, I don't understand all of these necessarily, but take a look at that and, and see what you think. Um, there's arguments we, d we shouldn't use, but we do need to stand on the Word of God. And, and we do need to understand that we don't have to be intimidated by the scoffer. His main motive is moral, and we have help for him and her. God can help us. Uh, their belief system starts with, since there is no God, no evidence is acceptable, no logic is acceptable, but amazingly, even scoffers can, can get saved. God is, is gracious. Uh, God is long-suffering. We see their character. We see their arguments. We see their ignorance. And the Bible says they're willingly ignorant. Uh, then finally, if they don't get saved, we see their doom. Uh, verse 7 again. Uh, it says, By the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Uh, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There's coming a time of, of judgment. There's coming a time when all this earthly things that we work for and hold so dear uh, will just be, what's it called when things burn up? Uh, ash. I mean, they'll just be gone. And uh, we need to understand, uh, they laughed at Noah before the flood. And yet the flood came. In uh, Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the flood. And one of the things he points out is that things were just normal. People accepted the, the common morality of the day. And in, in Matthew 24, verse 37, he says, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Listen, people will go on uh, scoffing at the Bible, laughing at you for going to church, uh, laughing at you for putting a sign on your back that says Jesus saves, or you know whatever, uh, but they will stand before God. At camp, we had a reading by one of the young ladies, uh, Ruby Van Komen. He titled it, The Boy Who Almost Went. And it was a reading about a young man deciding whether to get on Noah's Ark or not. And he decided not to. Of course, you know, everybody did but Noah's family. Um, they may laugh at you now, but someday they'll stand before God. Uh, we have a friend who, uh, he's, a, he's a Christian now, but before he was a Christian, he was a scoffer. And he used to love to give Christians a hard time, asking them this and that. He said, finally, one young lady said to him, Dave, what do you believe? And it stumped him. <laughs> he had to stop and, stop and think. And eventually, the Lord got a hold of his heart, and he got saved. And God was, was able to use him. Uh, you know, even in their mocking, 
uh, people can be open uh, to the truth and, and to, to a witness. Uh, you might be facing scoffers. Sometimes in your own home, in your own family, at work, at school. Uh, or you might be afraid that you will. You know, sometimes we're, we're afraid to say something or to, uh, to have a Christian witness because we think, oh, they'll, they'll laugh at me. Listen, don't let it trouble you. They are just fulfilling Scripture. You know, that, that should encourage us to understand. When people scoff and mock at the Bible, God's, they're just fulfilling what God said they'd do. But as well, remember they're willingly ignorant. God uses that expression here. Now, this is not something that's been forced on them. In, uh, I found it interesting, the word willing comes up again in verse 9. God is not willing that any should perish. They're willingly ignorant. God's not willing that they perish. God wants them to get saved. So even scoffers, you know, God has a heart for them. Just like God has a heart for you and, and for me. They're willingly ignorant. God's willing to save them. And uh, let me encourage you, don't be discouraged by current events. We're going to see a lot of things happen. And uh, I, I think I can pretty well guarantee it's, it's going to keep getting worse. It's going to be harder to live the Christian life. But God is still on the throne. God is still in charge of history. Uh, no matter what happens, God will see you through. Uh, there's such encouraging verses for us to cling to. Uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, he says, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, how's that start? Man, I, my mind's gone blank. I usually have to make a little note of how the things start. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. And one of my favorites is in Hebrews, where he says he'll never leave you or forsake you. The next verse says, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, that's a great verse, isn't it? Now, we need to understand, uh, mocking Scoffers may come, uh, but God is greater, and God is still on the throne, and God can use it in our lives. God can even use it in their life if you'll have a godly response uh, to their mocking. Our confidence is in the Lord. Uh, let's trust Him. Let me encourage you. Let's trust Him. Uh, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer this evening, and uh, let's just ask Him to, to help us with uh, the situations that we face. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that we know the truth, and the truth makes us free. Help us to share this with others. Lord, even those who are hard on us, even those who scoff and mock at, at your truth and at you. Lord, help us not to take it personally. Help us to remember that, that you were persecuted and, and, uh, and, and crucified. Father, help us to be like you. Lord, help us to win others by our lovely spirit. And uh, we pray that you'd use us. God, help us to be strong in you and to trust. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.